So just so everybody knows, the time on the computer is 7.01. We are waiting for one more counselor, so we are not able to call the meeting to order until the counselor shows up. If they don't show up by 7.30, uh, we are not able to have the meeting. Having said that, there are a couple of things that we can do and we can have some discussion as well, um, even if it isn't a formal meeting as such. So the first thing we will do is I the block in it. Okay, all right. So we have two uh, recognition awards that we want to have out today. Uh, first one is Trevor Stevens. And I guess we don't get to shake hands and no. have a big photo of and whatever, but this is a recognition of your five years of service and dedication to the town of Crossville. So there you are, and thank you very much. And the second recognition award is the Kathy Katie. And Kathy, thank you very much for your 15 years of service. <laughs> so we really appreciate your contribution to the community. Um, the other thing that we can have a discussion on if it um, doesn't require any form of motion, but if Russ and who's going to take the lead on reopening of the arena? And what the possibilities might be or not be. And, and maybe, Russ, if you can explain to where, how we got to where we are. Sure. So, uh, uh, we put together a reopening plan for the arena, uh, taking into account the guidelines as well as. Um, 
Alex, can you stand up and maybe talk to the council? Because I think we as council know, but I'm yeah, so the reopening plan that we put into place um, takes into account AHS guidelines as well as uh, safety concerns with staff, with the building, um, also keeping in mind the community as well. Um, the plan has been given to all of the user groups and uh, what we understand is there are some concerns over a couple of the uh, one of them being that uh, we're asking that uh, one parent per child go into the arena. A uh, couple of the main reasons for asking for that is, although the arena is a large building, it does have a lot of small spaces. Um, and the flow of people through that building is challenging. Um, just by the design, especially with the bleacher area, there's not a lot of room to go back and forth. Um, so that's one reason. The other is uh, just having kids run all over the building uh, as normal. Um, obviously we can't have that right now. So, um, so that was one of the, the concerns that's been brought up. And then the other concern is uh, the bleachers not being open for, for spectators. Um, again, in speaking with our health inspector, they want to make sure that we're able to uh, disinfect the bleacher area frequently. Um, they want to make sure that we are able to have people flow uh, easily, uh, not side by side. And then obviously social distancing or physical distancing, which we could achieve in there. Um, but one of the other reasons why we wanted to try and keep the bleachers closed for the time being was because we don't know how it's gonna work with the dressing room situation with um, the number of kids that may be going in and out of the arena. Obviously we can't have the normal number of people in each of those rooms. So we do have that first row of the bleachers to be, that could be used for dressing if needed. So um, all the measures that have been put in place um, obviously, or we hope, aren't going to be permanent. Um, they will be continually uh, you know, re reviewed and, and addressed as needed. Um, but our biggest, our biggest thing is we, we haven't been through this as everybody here hasn't been through this. So we need to see how opening the arena is going to work. And we wanna make sure that it works smoothly um, and safely. Uh, so that's our biggest thing. So um, we are not closed to suggestions. Um, if there's ideas that we can try, absolutely, we're willing to look at them. So um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's anybody here from minor hockey that has concerns about uh, this stuff that wanted to maybe speak and, and then we can hear it and we'll, you know, obviously want to try and move forward. So. A lot of the stuff too is, is uh, with Brian, yeah, we need to make sure that him and his staff are able to, uh, to, to uh, handle the, the workload as far as all the added disinfecting and cleaning that's gonna have to happen. So um, that's how you put your hand up if it's all right with the mayor. Certainly, yep. He just, we don't know. Sorry, thank you. I'm back here. Yeah. Oh. Just what we don't know. Oh, okay. So, my name is John Fleming. I'm the Common Director for Association of All of Our Hockey Development Team. And I've been the one who's been communicating with Hockey Alberta through this entire COVID situation. And, I, I, yeah, like you stated, our biggest concerns are bleachers and, and siblings. You know, as an association, our responsibility is to the kids on the ice, but we as an association have families, we have a very large community of, of you know, mothers, fathers, single parents, and allowing just like the one parent to be going with their one kid. I spoke to one family and she has three children who are in hockey. And it was suggested to put those people into child care while you drop your other child off. And the amount of hockey that we do, we have planned. We have a lot of free ice this year because we are not playing games. We are not doing tournaments. It's going to cost that parent $120 a week for childcare. 
And with the way the world is right now, some people aren't working. Nobody's making as much money as they used to. $120 a week is a lot of money right now, right? And I, as for Hockey Alberta, when I sat in their meeting, that they said they would never enforce or implement anything that goes above and beyond what AHS is recommended. I said Arvina is not a very large facility, but it is still has enough room for social distancing or even require members of children to wear masks. Obviously, there's an age restriction on children to under age of two, I believe it is, to wear a face shield, right? As for the kids running around the arena, as a board member and association, we can communicate to our, our parents and our members that your kid sits beside you, car stairs, Memorial Arena has the exact same rule. Kids sit beside you, they stay there. If they can't sit beside you and stay there, bring stuff has the authority to say, you're out. Right? I mean, it's, we have to think about the families. Like, we have, I think that's just a soft number with all the members we have, plus our figure skating association, plus the other people that we have, probably seven, eight hundred people involved in this, right? And you know, we don't have to think about single parents. It's, it's a community, and, you know, Hockey Alberta says 50 people on the ice. We have a great of 30. I'm not sure why. We brought that number down. Ice surface size is ice surface size, right? Hockey rink is a hockey rink on the ice, on the field of play is what they refer to it. And then they recommend 100 people in a facility. Is that's a lot for our rink, and I understand that. I don't expect to have 100 people in our rink, but allowing 50 to 60 parents, you know, lobby because right now my understanding is they're allowed the glass and in the lobby. I think they will be better spaced out than bleachers. I truly do. Right? And this association, we are parents who require to give eight hours a kid of volunteer time. We can help with the sanitation. We can assign parents. Like that's, with all the people in our association, you're looking at over 780 hours of volunteer work that we can do to help wipe down doors, locker rooms, clean gear, wipe down whatever touch we touch as an association. I can only speak for my association. I can't speak for fear because I don't know what their plan is, but and then like we had discussed in our board meeting about using the Lions loft while our kids from the ice it says 30 people were allowed up there. But then for some reason it is only restricted to Scouts of Canada group. I'm not sure how it is just isolated to one single group and not the association. Like how why is that there? I don't understand. So their rental space or their group that's their club space. And again, just trying to account for the total number of people who spread this over. But it's not maybe not necessarily just for my own figure skating, but if there's other rental sources that come in and say that we don't want to over and over again. Yeah, that, that's the question I had. If I can't have <clears throat> my parents downstairs, why can't as a club of organization, why can't I bring up there? Why can't I put 30 parents and kids over? I mean, that's, that's a question. I mean, when I read this, I saw that, and then like right down on your bullet points, right down your one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh bullet point, all the user groups are expected to follow rules, guidelines, and recommendations put in by their governing body. I've sat in all our governing body meetings. They've all said that they will not go above and beyond what the agents have recommended. And that's what we've done here. We have, we've cut it down to the bare minimum instead of following what AHS has recommended, right? Like, I'm perfectly fine wearing face masks. I'm perfectly fine wiping down everything we use. If we can't use the equipment under the stairs, I get it. I'll supply all my coaches with pylons, cups, cones, everything they need. But to not let parents come in, I have a daughter, I have two daughters. One who's currently injured fell out of a two-story window, right? She cannot play. I would like her to come to the rink watch her TV play when she is able to. I have a four-year-old daughter who's going to be on the ice for the first time this year. I want to be able to see her skate, and I want her mother to be able to see her skate. And we're not taking that into consideration. We're just, we're locking it down. And I don't think that is, the kids have gone through enough this year. Families have gone through enough to not enjoy what my parents got to see. My grandpa went to be playing hockey. I think we're depriving families of that. 
that's that's pretty much where I'm we're sitting with this as an association. And I'm I'm saying this is more of a parent than a board member. I also I have coached there for three years. I have been coaching both my daughters on teams. And I feel as though the restrictions are too tight. We're gonna lose. We already have requests to leave the association to go to Erdry because they allow parents in the stands. Parents love to help get dressed. We should they show up dressed, and that's fine. I support that 100 percent My kids show up with just put a helmet on for one case. That's fine. I support 100 percent Locker rooms, kids can show up, but kids do have to go to the washroom. I coached initiation last year with an average of five kids of practice and coach. Right? And then we have a new five coaches. Those kids are four years old, five years old. Their mom and dad have to be there to help them go to the bathroom. I can't do that. That's inappropriate. We need to have allow people in the arena to enjoy the sport. And they just need to be responsible. Right? We, need, we just need to give them a chance to enjoy the sport. If it's a shield, I saw that you guys can provide sanitation. I can provide my team managers with free balls, whatever. If you want to train, I will bring all my team managers in. You can show them how to clean. We have a lot of volunteers. Can I just ask for clarification? It was my understanding that you took a, a look at what all the groups needed, and the one with the most stringent requirements is the one that you're kind of aiming towards so that it doesn't disallow any group in? Is that kind of where we've ended up with some of these numbers? Somewhat, but more so just, more so look and build, but yes, a little of what all the groups need. You know, and trying to look at how we can best start, uh, I think is how we're, we're looking at this. Is like, here's a starting point and see how things go and, and then move forward. Um, uh, that's kind of where we started, and, and also looking at the safety of the staff and that being put into a situation where they're going to be exposed, potentially exposed to a lot of people. Um, so, trying to look at that, at what they're able to accomplish in a short time. It's figure skating and hockey at the same time are different for kids. They, uh, they follow each other. Follow each other yeah. so. so with some of the points raised here now, is, is there enough, um, is there an opportunity for more discussion? I, I don't see why not. I mean, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Jonathan. Hi, John. Um, you mentioned the potential for there to be volunteer support yes. in terms of parents coming in and saying this. Um, I'll, I'll be very blunt about this. When we looked at this, um, Airdrie has much deeper financial resources than we do, and in terms of reopening their arenas, they're throwing a ridiculous amount of money in staff and cleaning supplies and sanitation and, and, and. And part of this discussion was that, at least internally, was, you know, hey, to do these things, we just can't afford it. Um, if you had a reliable base of volunteers to wipe down doors and sanitize this and, and nuke the world with a sanitizer, um, that would change the equation. Exactly. Um, and and if we can have a discussion about changing the equation, let's, let's have that discussion. Yeah. Yeah, because like I said, our, our, our parents are part of the $200 volunteer check. And I think the previous season that required, we deposited three out of 93 families, we deposited three checks. So it means every family, because we're supposed to have a casino, we're definitely not having it this year. We usually have tournaments, that's where parents get their volunteer hours. We are not having that this year. They're going to be cleaners. They're going to be cleaners. And they can do that. And that's, you know, that's the community coming together to help. Uh, we don't expect you guys to hire seven, <coughs> ten, fifteen anymore. We will help. That's that's what the community does. We rally around it. We figure it out. John, you can do it. Uh, I can say something. Yeah. yeah. So I went to our money on the president of the association. So would we say we have this many hours? Right? It's potentially more than that. I think if you go, it's just to go all year long, you get two volunteer hours. So you know, there's formulas that we come up with where potentially are doing like 10 hours of actual work to get four hours of volunteer and stuff like that. So we do have a lot of, uh, you know, we, we can definitely kind of help in that way. So 
and the casino and everything else, and yet yeah, the obligation of the parents to do the voluntarily, you've got to find basically well, so yeah, and, 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 and our associations that are really right. financially suffer due to we get a fair bit of money from tournaments and our casinos. I'm not sure the exact number, yeah. but we're gonna we're gonna keep to this year. Yeah. So we're just trying to, to make it the most positive experience. And people don't need to see what's going on behind the scenes because it's always scrambling, it's money, yeah. how we get organized. That's what team managers are for. They are responsible to keep track of volunteer hours. They're supposed to report it to our, I believe, our tournament coordinators. We were tournament coordinator this year because somebody has to have something to do because we're not having tournaments this year. So we, we don't have a lot of free agents, not any free agents. No. Well, yeah, yeah, but we can figure out a way to stay and we will get that one. I think with the 15 minutes, we can do something like that. Sorry, can I jump in? Yeah. Uh, like, I've been through the system, you know, from day one, and my son's. Last year, they did it as well, and it's a fourth year degree. But something to think about as well is we have the Russell Minor Hockey Association from the OTBS, but we still have to get the other ice users on board, like figure skating. And we also have to get either Simon Valley, I don't know who else, Brittany is going to be able to run the red ice here still. Here, and Simon Valley. We have to get them on board because everybody's going to be safe. I, that's, I mean, the devil's advocate there. So that, just, the, you, you can't just say, okay, this group gets to do this, and well, okay, well, you know, here he comes in and then shut the doors. You can't come in, well, why? Because, you know, you're not sanitizing. So that's a big plan. We have to get together with uh, uh, the other ice groups, uh, ice users. Having said that, if if they do have enough volunteers, that might free up some staff as well, which could maybe then, yeah. But it, I that's mean, a big plan. Yeah, okay. exactly. It's For worth sure. an, it's worth another relook, uh, in my opinion, okay. and just see what we can come up with. Because I mean, you know, they, these are unusual times for all of us, right? And so who knows what's going to happen with school opening up? I mean, this could be a moot point in two weeks. We could be in total lockdown again. Or it could just be, you know, just smooth sailing and, you know, stuff opens up and, and as fast as things changed at the beginning, they could change that fast again upcoming, depending on what happens, right? So um, as best as we can, you know, we, we try to protect everybody and find that balance, right? Yeah, you gotta get the kids back to some form of balance. I think I think they could really use it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sure, yes. I think that's an important point to bring up when you're talking with the, the other associations that run the arena in presenting the possibility of having a volunteer do it. This isn't about anybody's game, this is about making something for the children. It's a kid, yeah. It was it was awesome. Awesome. yeah. Right. And, and that's a good point. You know, if you really press that home, uh, then, and I mean, you know, again, for some of the parents that aren't working, have more time. Uh, if they want their kids to get back to you know, what we think is normal or as normal as we can get right now, then there's a great opportunity to get them involved and you know, it kind of gives them something to do in the interim as well, right? And, and be involved. So, and if I can say something to that, uh, we did have meetings with uh, uh, the skating club, and their restrictions are way tougher than what we put up. 
And the problem being is that they have to monitor the people coming in, take names, temperatures, they got a dedicated person to do that. And that's going to be a problem selling to them how one group can come in and, and take care of it themselves. And, and another group, and they have to live by state canon rules, it's not theirs. So that's kind of the level that we've achieved, right? Because that's the toughest level. Right. It and is kind of where we went with it. Yeah. And, you know, it's a hard one to say because they don't have the luxury of changing it. Right. The state of Canada put their restrictions on them. And they have to follow their restrictions. Well, don't they already have all the restrictions too, though? I mean, the state of Canada has mandates that they have to hire coaches. And then the hockey is not. So if you take that differentiation between the associations that far, well, if you right. allow, like where you forgot that well, if, if, but if we don't achieve what uh, Skate Canada needs, then basically we're eliminating uh, figure skating. Because if we don't hold it to that standard, unless is there, is there an option that if hockey is done, that there's, I don't know, and I'm just throwing random stuff out here, that there's an hour in between so that that's it can be clean to the standard that, that Skate Canada needs? Like, is there, a, is there a different way to do that? Well, I mean, I scheduling, scheduling could be could be done, but at, at, the, at the rate and it's not going to charge. It still has to be. There still has to be like we're already looking at hiring extra staff, right. which is is roughly between you know eight hundred and fifty and a thousand dollars a week extra mm -hmm. that can be had for us. But you know, seriously, like we we're already doing that and we're adding to it, right. and that's just to try to keep up. And the reason being we had to lock, kind of lock down, because it's another clean hit. It's, we have to be able to get up there. They got cloth seats like this. Once they're sat on, they can't be touched for like, I think it's been 24 hours or something before the next group can use it. So it can be, it can be a, a continual uh, five to six group use it, and then a, a 615, 715 group come up and use it. And, and that's where the problem lies. And, and also, Volunteers is a good suggestion. Um, if, if everybody, if, if there's a particular person from every group that wants to do it, and the fact that they go through Russ's women's course, because we deal with chemical. We just can't let people have chemical. And we take women's for that reason. We wear safety gear for the same reason. And, and that's a big part. Volunteers is really good. Volunteering in, in Stuff like that isn't really, it's not effective for the simple reason if somebody gets something or gets hurt volunteering and, and falls in a stance while they're waiting, who's responsible for that person? Is that a WC? If it's one of my staff, it's a w, WCB. If it's a volunteer, how do we cover that person? Association. Association. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. they have to that. Are they insured through volunteers? Yeah. Is that all insurance? Because yeah. you said, well, you're up in the stands. Yeah. So the the owner has a plan for even if you get COVID while playing hockey. Like they are covered. But we have a discussion about this, and it was added this summer. It's just, it's 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 just things to think about when, when we talk about volunteering and, and different things. It's, I think it's the responsibility of, of my staff at the arena, the town, to, to keep our staff safe, is what the rest said. But not only keeping our staff safe, it's keeping the user group safe, the other user groups, it's uh, keeping the other workers in town, uh, the community at large safe. I know, yeah. And, and if something ever comes out of the arena, and, and, and hopefully, you know, hopefully, you know, Mary Jo said, so hopefully the schools work and the arena can work, because I, I highly doubt the arena will work if the schools don't. Right. I have a feeling we're, we're, we're doing this for nothing. And it's a lot of money to put ice in. I wish I could have waited a month to put ice in and find out if the schools are going to do it. But we're not. We're going to go ahead and do it as if. And, and I think with the cooperation of everybody, it will work. I'm, I'm very positive that we can make it work. By, by letting so many people into the building, it's just the reason you're not having casinos is for the same reason that you can't have a whole bunch of people in an arena. That, you know what I mean? It's kind of, you can't have a casino to the people. Yeah, I, I get that too, but it's like we, 
we're trying to limit the amount. We're doing it, like you say, for the kids, number one. It, 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 and that's what it should be about. So maybe, maybe as difficult as it is, uh, we'll still have you guys have another discussion, but maybe the way it's going to end up being is that for the first month until we can basically refer to how the schools go, that it is as stringent as it is with the possibility that as soon as we get, you know, some more opening at the school that we go to these, you know, to the, to the volunteers perhaps, or open it up more. Like, do you guys think you could live with it for a month? I mean, I, just, I have a lot of, I'm sure you guys have gotten a lot of emails. I've gotten a lot of emails. There's a lot of, I mean, also at parents, I can handle, you know, if it's, if it's handling, but I mean, the school, they are, you know, loosening their grip on the schools and right. classrooms about all that, no, not, okay, schools are full social right. distancing in class. Mm -hmm. Right, we all know schools are huge conditions. It doesn't get to be over half of every, but they loosen their grip. And I have to say, someone who's heard, and I'm not a little type of child, I have to take notes and stuff, yeah, safety training, first aid, all kinds of stuff. I mean, I understand that we're talking about a squirt bottle and a racket, right? That's, they're not going to be climbing and cleaning windows. It's that they open down those bleachers at their own risk every time we're in the rain. So, even the students going to school have to wipe down their own desk before they arrive and wipe their desk down when they leave. And when the school shut down in March, there were 22 kids in a class. And on the news tonight, there was a school where their daughter went back. And then there were 33 kids in the class. So sure. this is where I have all these questions. I know, I know. And it seems like there's a different rule every day. The lady right in the back. Sorry, I have the same point, sir. Okay. So oh, like, okay. I know you were really focusing on the biggest thing, and that is the concern. But then at the schools, I know it's not the same as the arena, but there's children that don't have limits that are going to be required to wipe down your desk. And I call all the time to say, wipe the children's phone call. I will learn. And just on the safety end of things, there, that service that they're accepting the schools. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we as an organization will have to look at. Yeah. To determine if we're really doing that. Right. And we're also about to leave the children who are experiencing the adults. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of hurt the for the rent. I mean, I mean a, a discussion can be had, and we can definitely look at those options. Um, uh, the other thing is, like, having volunteers who do the sanitizing, it still does ultimately come back to the town. Something does happen, so we just have to make sure that they broke it. And that's funny. I have to speak as a manager to every team. Well, I can go to people and I can walk my people through it. I mean, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Okay, like that. That's why I'm here. Because at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is that we get as many people using the arena yeah, as possible, and that no one group. Uh, and when I say as possible under the certain under the current circumstances, okay, and that no group is eliminated because if we're doing all of this and then uh, State Canada says, well, if you're not going to achieve those goals, nobody can do figure state. That's not what we're trying to do either. So uh, I think. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. They they are staying there. Yes. So, but they've eliminated a lot of them. But every arena is different too. You got to remember, like we talked about Genesis Place as an arena, the entire building is set up to, to deal way better with stands. They come in a door, they go up the staircase to a set of stands. They don't touch or pass anybody. We don't have the luxury. And that's part of our Alberta Health. We got a 38 inch wide walkway to get into our stands. No two people can pass. Open up the back. Well, that's a, a fire rest, so now you're going into. Yeah, now it's a different set. That's a different yeah. The lady behind you? Yes. So I'm going to ask a question because I've never been in the Hockey Association, not the Baker Stadium Association. But, and I don't know how many, well, obviously, I'm going to use the word use the term. I'm just kind of like using the term. What is our hockey and the stadium? Well, except that you're trying to have them in, in all these different locations at different times, different availabilities. So we, I don't think the scheduling is quite that simple. So I mean, we, but maybe that maybe that's something we have to look at it this year. It's like you have to not do games and tournaments. I don't know. Yeah, every day's a day. Yeah, we have someone whose sole job is ice sketching. That's 
all they do for our association issue, right? We, we only have 16. It's, it's, I don't think you can do that. I mean, I'm sure I haven't done it. I'm sure I it. it can be done. Right? Okay, so, so I guess for the interest of um, the people that are um, involved, let's have another discussion. Reach out to Brian and Russ. And, Russ, and the two of you can reach out to the people that you know, that are with whatever group and see if we can come up with something different. How does that sound? Yeah, well, that was a yeah, discussion, right? So just, yeah, 100%. I just don't want to be here and have this sort of discussion and we go to like a closure meeting that I just, I don't know, so the fear of getting stonewalled, right? When, you know, with the latest thing, like I know that's going to be, it's going to be the biggest thing, right? Well, it is. If you, if you designate somebody, it's a uh, one hour course. Yeah, and if it's available online, like it is, it is, yeah, it is online. Like all of our coaches are now required by Hockey Canada to do an online training course for COVID as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Lady in back. I understand that you're talking about that there's a space that you're not supposed to pass, but from a kind of direction, starters, we pass people all the time. But, 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 I just think we overthink that. Well, we might have. There, there's kind of two sets of circumstances here because municipalities are held to a different level than a, and than a grocery store. You should be you should be maintaining that distance no matter where you are. Part of the challenge comes in, and I think because it's such a, a minefield that everybody probably is more cautious and aware or trying to follow the rules better. But when the town becomes liable, we really have that's our lens. So it doesn't matter whether it's the arena, whether it's the skate park, whether it's uh, you know our property out at the rodeo grounds. Everything that's that's basically the first lens you look to is is risk and liability. And so as soon as you start looking at that and the regulations of how narrow that door is and how do you get traffic going through where they're not passing each other, if you can get your kid to sit by you and that's a requirement, that's great because you can't have the kids running around. And if all of a sudden three people get sick and the place gets shut down, then who was it that did or didn't do, you know, the Who's liable? Everybody yeah. nowadays yeah. has a and, 2022 and, life. Yeah. I mean, we can wear two use masks now. Like, I know in the industry, I'm not going to go to Sobeys, I the room in Walmart. I, do. I work in Calgary, I have to wear face masks all day. I mean, I work in my day, once I leave my day, face masks on. Exactly. And that's something you can't consider. I mean, if that's, you know, if you're in a narrow hallway, the rules, like the NHS says, if you can't adhere to social distancing, you should. Yeah. And as long as that kid's done over the age of two, and AHS really wants you not only to have the face mask, but to maintain the distance because they don't want a false sense of security with just face masks. Yeah. Although, like you say, now all of a sudden AHS is as long as the kids are all facing yeah. the same way, now all of a sudden that's all over. Yeah, so all I, don't, I don't know yes. how that all of a sudden happened. Anyway, um, just we are past 7 30, so there is no point uh, that administration. Yeah, I've recorded that at 7.30 no quorum existed and I've recorded the absence of the, the attendees. Okay, so it will just uh, keep the discussion going, but I think I think we have enough to for you guys to meet and, and go over this again. Am I right? Yeah? yeah. And yeah, so we'll see if we can come up with something. Brian Russell, really Brian worked with us, and I think we just need to put something out on the paper that says you guys have said this is in the plan. Yeah, so right. if we kind of said, well, hey, how about we'll this? Mm -hmm. we but we also said it was a plan to continue moving forward too. It's not a it's not set in stone and we're not we're yeah. hoping that by January, December, October, we can do way more. But as we discussed it, and Mark, you were privy to that, that we discussed the fact that we'd rather do what we're doing to start with and get comfortable doing it and add more to it. Then go right into it and then have to draw it back when the regulations get as hard. I'd rather, hey, we can add people to the stands, we can add more people. It's easier to do that than it is to take away. Yeah. And, and that was our the way we wanted it to go out. And, it, and it's, uh, what did uh, Christina say? It's, like, it's a living thing. It's going to change day to day, the same as Alberta Health helps us. So that's something to keep in mind too, John. This is today, might not be tomorrow, right? And we're hoping that that goes well. 
And we can do this, we have to add to it. And they not the other way. You'll get information we're trying to bring in the Movie Center to our association that there, you know, there was some we had for you. So there's gonna be, but there is people aren't happy to put a lot of things, but well, we don't it's like what we do. have to do. Everybody's given up something. Yeah. And, and some have given jobs up because of it. So right. we the gotta think of that too. So maybe we have to ask another question. But with this. If you have volunteers that have limits in to their work that they can talk to the tree, does that suffice? He uses different kinds of rules than I do. Yeah. Right, but so it's, it's, it's not really chemical specific. It's identifying on scene situations and then kind of warning layers of what, you know, what to do in certain situations. Right. So it's really it's 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 an umbrella, I guess you could say. And they're, they're doing it, they're trying to do a universal slip. Took it once, like you say. Right. We took it once, it was good, covered everything. But right now, I think it still is the board place. It's an umbrella something now. But if somebody has to do this to teach your students, would that surprise? Would that surprise? If some of their volunteers have limits that meet your standards with limits, does that surprise? I and, 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 and I'm not sure we have a quick answer. Again, we have to check with our insurance company and our lawyers, yes. right? Right away, because their their witness might they might by regulation of their job might not be able to use it as an volunteer somewhere else. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. I just had one comment about the younger kids and families who can't necessarily can't for three dollars a week for childcare. What if? If the volunteers are sanitizing, can they not sanitize that upstairs room? And one of the volunteers be in there for their team for those younger kids? Yeah, but then I don't really get deep here though. Yeah. And again, you just need to play the part of kids play the part of the And then we're back to the kind of comments about the chairs, like you know exactly which chair the kids sat right. on, you know. So I mean, there's there's some consideration there. Okay. Well, uh, I think this is great, and so if that answers some of the people's um, reasons for being uh, here tonight, then you know we'll we'll uh, make a second discussion group out of it, and uh, go from there. We'll try to set up a meeting through one or three of us. Okay, and and for the rest of the people here, um, I guess because we don't have quorum tonight, then let's hold a special meeting for next Tuesday. And uh, then hopefully everybody can be here, and it will be seven o'clock as usual. And uh, I, I just did want to mention. Um, okay, go ahead. So what did you have for the rest of the day? Um, had not heard. <coughs> he got his agenda last week, and uh, so I haven't heard from him today. So. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, and and I don't know if this is of interest to anybody or not, but. Uh, it's kind of in response to some of the questions about parking on Railway Street. And I, I guess because I've been on council the longest, maybe I've seen um, more changes than, than maybe other people have. And I think it's been a problem uh, for parking ever since we had more than just cars and trucks of assorted sizes and et cetera. So, you know, back in the day, it was a car or was some kind of a truck. The cars parked angle parking on the west side, trucks parallel parked on the east side. And then pretty soon you have crossovers and SUVs and, you know, which are, depending on the conversation, can be classified as cars or not cars. So then you've got height issues and then sometimes you've got length issues if you drive a little sun fire and you're parked at an angle beside them. So then there was lots of discussion about how do you regulate that, make it safe for everybody? So there was discussion about length of vehicle, there was discussion about height of vehicle, neither of which was optimum. Um, there was a discussion a long time ago about going parallel on the west side of railway. Uh, that was not well received. So then we reduced the speed limit and we decided to reduce the speed limit in all of town so that it would make it safer for traveling on railway as one of the options. Uh, the business has certainly provided us with feedback that they don't like parallel parking because it reduces the amount of parking spaces in front of businesses. And a lot of people, um, you know, it, it, it's just a privilege of living in a small town where you can pull right up in front of a business and park. Um, you know, if you go to Airdrie to, I don't know, Super Drug Market or whatever that has a parking lot, 
you're probably not as likely to be able to park right in front, but yet yeah, but that's that's one of the things we enjoy about living here. Uh, again, the businesses did not want parallel parking. So then one of the things we thought we could maybe try was changing the angle of how we parked. So we tried that for a while and although it quasi sometimes works, as soon as there's snow on the, on the street, everybody goes back to the standard angle of parking because that's what we're all used to. So then uh, Eric, we had some professionals come out of the states, they wanted to look around Crossfield, see how we were doing things and give us some critiques on, you know, um, laneways and spacing on houses and all kinds of things. And they thought one of the things that we should consider was reverse angle parking, which went nowhere because that, we watched that in Calgary, there's a hotel, uh, what is that, 12th or 13th Avenue or whatever that does that, doesn't go as well as, as you would think. The town doesn't own any of the land on the east side of a railway. And so because the businesses really want to maintain the angle parking on the west side, we have now left the angle parking on the west side. It is the standard angle parking. We are going to remove the parking from the east side. That gives everybody more space. It will make it safer. And we are including angle parking on some of the off streets where as Crossville grows, the downtown district will grow to the west. And as the residentials disappear over the next hundred years. Uh, those streets will widen. You see that already on some of the blocks where it's wider at railway and then narrows down. And so there'll be opportunity for parking there. Uh, we pay the taxes on the public parking lot to give some parking availability for people as well. And so I guess the reason that I say this is because there has been probably over, I would say this, this little list of things that I'm referring to is probably 25 years of discussions from time to time about parking. Uh, you know, if we if we were at car stairs where they had that really right way, uh, you know, maybe if we could pick up the whole town and move it over so we had more room, uh, it's not going to happen. We are going to see a sidewalk along the east side of the railway. Lots of people have indicated that they would like a more walkable town. And it would be nice for people to be able to go over to Subway, over to Carmen's, over to the Shell, and actually be able to find an area, well, even parking lot, where there's a drop area where they can actually get across. You can bring your baby stroller. If you're somebody with uh, accessibility, um, you know, whether it's a walker or whatever, even myself, when you're trying to climb over the snow to get into Carmen's parking lot or you're walking on the road, um, these are all things to make our town improved, beautified, uh, some trees, some landscaping, some benches. Um, you know, you go to other communities, they do have beautification. And it wasn't that long ago I went for a holiday in BC. Everything there, of course, is green, lush, looks lovely. Came back to Crossfield, it was a Saturday afternoon, and there's a tumbleweed rolling down the street. And I thought, yeah, welcome to Crossfield. Like, you know, when you think we've done it right or not right, I just want you to know there's been a lot of research, a lot of work, a lot of history to the parking that we're trying to come up with a resolution to. And if we did the deep services on railway and we didn't put in connections to the properties that are vacant and somebody decided to build there and we dug up the street, you would hear no end of, of criticism that, you know, how, how come we didn't do it at the time? If we just did the street and we didn't do the sidewalks, I think we do a disservice to our businesses. Because as you look along the sidewalk on the west side of the railway, um, you know, the signs that used to regulate parking, they've just been sawed off. Uh, we've had, you know, posts there that have flowers on them. We've had different things. Some of those create holes, some of them are just still there. Uh, the designs on the sidewalk are different. Uh, we've got somebody that had, um, drainage challenges so they put in a you know a, a piece of drainage there that's a, a metal and it it meets their needs but it doesn't look nice and i think that those businesses deserve a nice looking sidewalk from head to end yes if we have to dig the sidewalk up then you've got a section of new but if it all starts looking the same we have a better opportunity to make it look nice if somebody does have to dig it up 
And yes, the argument about this doesn't bring businesses to railway, 100% true, but if I was going to open a business on railway, I would rather move in after the services are done and they're brand new services and move in now with 50 year old services that we already know by research, by camera, by everything else are at the end of their life. So to do it all at once, it, I realize if, you know, we'd love it to be done different. It's going on budget, on time. It is going ahead as planned. And we love it when it's done. And so that's the history of the background. Yes. Hey Joe, uh, I was watching White's book with the railway and lots of them down to the name of the city. What's going to be the right hand turn lane part? The first one does, you guys can bump that back and make the lane again. Yes. Yep. Yeah. As soon as possible. Yes. Sorry. Um, we are new to town. We moved into the center. So, to be honest, I think you guys would do a great job getting this up as quickly as you want. Thank you. I kind of like to see what the plans were before and what was drawn up. Like, I'm assuming you guys have a partner. Yeah. Yeah, we could. Because we, we were no matter <laughs> looking on Facebook, there's a lot of people moving into town. And I think if we, if I can push the terms in, on the town website. I, and we did, and just uh, thank you for that because that popped something else into my head. We did have open houses on it. Uh, there was there was public input, there was business input. We really heavily relied on business input because they're the most impacted. Um, and lots of people did show up. I know that not everybody finds out. And it doesn't matter whether you put it on the paper, whether you put it on uh, social media. Uh, there are people that are missed somehow, some way, but there were people that did find the information and did attend and did provide feedback. But yeah, we, we can certainly repost that information and, and it's available too if you want to stop in the town office. So, yes. A couple points I'd like to add about the, the downtown project. Um, this is overwhelmingly driven by age and the structure that needs to be replaced. A lot of the stuff that's being pulled out of Railway Street went in there in 1952. Mm -hmm. um, about three years ago, we sent the little robotic cameras and scrubbers and flushers down into our sewer lines to have a professional evaluation of the status of our our uh, sewer lines and we came back with quite a number of links where the engineering comment was uh, danger of imminent collapse um, in terms of fixing our sewers we had no choice if the choice is danger of imminent collapse or fix it i will fix it that wasn't a universal opinion by everybody but i it's a decision i am absolutely confident in that. Bringing in the new sewer capacity does a lot more than keep it from collapsing. It enables development in Iron Landing, it enables development in the portion, the eastward draining portion of the New Ox Landing subdivision. It facilitates development across the highway in the northern portion of our community. So it sets the foundation for future growth and our sewers law. Another major portion of this uh, railway upgrade is a water main upgrade. The town of Crossfield's water system, when it was put in 30, 40, 50 years ago, we had a pump on the pump house on, on limit in a central location that fed through an awful lot of small lines to town and it worked reasonably well. Ten years ago when we relocated our main water pump out of New Iron Road for a central direction, of the lot avenue because the water is now being fed from a single point in town rather than multiple points of distribution we had a dramatic drop in the fire flows available throughout town currently because most of the water runs through a fairly narrow pinch point uh, there's very substantial portions of town that do not meet the recommended fire flows for emergency services by putting in a 15 inch main from Lot Avenue all the way up to Rail up to Mountain, we actually put a, a pre bid in last year, we will be bringing the vast majority of town up to recommended fire flows so that we have the appropriate fire safety for our citizens. 
It also facilitates additional development. Right now in Iron Landing and in the Vista subdivision and also in the Hawks Landing subdivision, we would be not able to pro uh, approve, for example, uh, townhouses because the fire flow requirements of townhouses are different than the duplexes and bigger flow developments. We also could not approve any commercial development because there would be inadequate fire flows to support that. Uh, by bringing in a 15 inch main, uh, the full length of railway uh, all the way up to mountain, we solve the vast majority of the fire flow issues in town. We still have a few bits we need to do. It's not a complete project. But again, bringing fire flows to the majority of town up to the recommended levels is an important part of this project. A third criteria is uh, storm management. Um, we had a new burger joint open up, with, I guess, a few, several weeks ago. Relatively minor rain event floods them up because the sewer line or the storm lines in uh, railway were put in, and they, they, in the design standards were just way different back then. Uh, we're going from what are essentially typically 24 inch storm lines right now to 48 or 36, 40, depends where you are, up to 16 storm lines. We're approximately eightfold increasing the storm management capacity of an off railway. Uh, that will have a meaningful impact on a lot of the streets feeding into railway street. Do you think the cost of recovery on that when developers are going to be using that number or are you taking that entire cost off? That, yeah, that would be integrated into our off-site levies. Anything that, uh, like for example, the developer comes into town, we charge them a prorated portion of the, the sewer system, the water pump hours. Everything I mean, that's all going to the off-site levy. That's we need the money. I'm recovering every penny I can from anybody who will give it to me. Um, so when you add up those three things, um, people have focused on the cosmetics of this, and the cosmetics are important. I think it is an important thing to do. This is literally a once in a this is literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. But the overwhelming majority of the cost of this project is deep underground infrastructure. And we, we just we, we literally did not have a choice. So what was the big increase from I think it was like just over six million before and it's run up to over ten. What's the big increase there? It was never six. It's increased substantially. Uh, well the upsides may make sense when the upsides make the I mean, the it'll be something like that. Well, we went in and as a national increase as a as a preliminary before we even started designing this project, we had full master plans for the entire town for water, sewer, and storm. So we have comprehensive master long term plans. And yeah, there was some revisions up there. Um, I mean, we factored in some growth across in both Hawks Landing and Iron Landing. Uh, the storm. We're bringing the storm, one of the projects we did last year was we're bringing storm water from the other side of the, the railway tracks, across the railway tracks, and then down the main drain course. And yeah, there's a lot of water there. I mean, crossroads build on swamp, we all know that. And yeah, I was I was shocked when we reworked the, the storm management numbers. Like I mean the, the conduit going under railway street is it's a five foot, it's a five foot storm line. Those aren't cheap. Um, we do need to emphasize, though, that in the long term, this is a very, very substantial cost savings. We had our engineers do an estimate of uh, probable costs if we did piece by piece, block by block, by block, the way we were doing. And our estimate is doing it in one shot, taking into account that we're getting some very, very favorable pricing right now because of the way the economy is. Our estimate is the cost of doing it in one big gigantic shot versus a piece we did over many years is about six million dollar saving. And given the necessity of getting it done, the long term uh, foundation it lays for future growth of the town, the dealing with the drainage issues, the dealing with the water pressure issues, the dealing with the sewers that are end of life, the long term growth capacity, and the six million dollar savings. When we added that all up, yes, this project is a stretch for the town of Crossing. Uh, we had to borrow five million dollars to make this project work. The other half we're taking out of our financial reserves. Um, 
COVID in a perfect world, I probably wouldn't have scheduled this during a global pandemic. Um, but it is absolutely a necessary project, cost savings of it, changes to the fundamental backbone of the structure of the town in a very positive way. I, I, I have no doubt that this is absolutely the right project to do. The cosmetics above ground, you know, that is the input of many, many people. We had five people come up with that design. If the three people here did it, it might have been a different design where we had two good colleagues on council in a couple months. Maybe if they we looked at it, they might have done something different. But the overwhelming driver on this is infrastructure. And for 50 years, we, we don't know how long we really last. It's a very, very long time. For my lifetime, we have made a crushing change to the good, to the fundamental backbone and structure of this town. And we've got it at a phenomenal price relative to what it would have taken to do it in a peaceful approach. So, speaking of which, do we know when we're going to have the uh, code of conduct information and attendance on behalf of the room council on the scale? Uh, that, yes, that was dealt with. And or is that going to be made public? Uh, was, was it public? The, the, part that, the part that isn't available for public is available. Uh, most of it is not available because of. Um, because it had to do with the, the contract itself. It's a code of conduct. Yeah. Public investigation. It should be public. And, and you know what, Bill? I was not part of that group that did the investigation. So if you can wait till next council meeting, uh, we can have more information on that. Because I'll get that to you. Yes, Katie. Just on so the uh, infrastructure, all our units would be put in high speed fiber optics. Yes, yeah, so we've got, we've got we got conduits for fiber optics. We don't um, actually have the fiber optics, but we, it could be really cheaply run. Okay. Um, when you say about the work, you can uh, about the fire alarm in some parts of the town that are not to code? Yes, there's a lot. Is that currently right now? Yes, that's currently right now. How long has it been going on? And some parts of town have not been. That major so change happened in when the big water reservoir was that 2011? Yeah. I might I might be a year off of that over at Cobb one of It's not seriously off, but it's off enough that it's on the Yeah, and, and these, these aren't mandatory requirements, not like it's not like a building code, but it's it's a recommend it's a building recommendation. Oh it's a recommended code. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I was on I was on the cross the fire department in the nineteen eighties and we had to carry five different adapters to adapt to all the hybrids in the hospital. Yeah. Because every councillor decided they're going to have one from Calgary, Lethbridge, Edmonton. So there we are, half our supplies are in front of the They were looking for a bargain back then. Yes. So, so whose recommendation is this? This is the fire department's recommendation? No, is this? Well, we used to operate out of a town rural. So yeah. if you try to get the rural and the town together to do anything, it's a challenge, right? So the so rural guys you didn't think the fire department needed it. Really not for us. They couldn't understand why they needed that. Let's let it burn down, right? Yeah. And so I mean, there's we've come a long, long way. Everybody oh, for sure. Who knows what kind of fire department we got? Oh, for sure. But one thing that we have done with upgrading is that all our hybrids now are coming down with the same kind of standards. Yeah. So these guys, that, these new trucks we got, they can die. They can go on. Those, right. those, 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 those recommendations are provincial recommendations. Also, what we do to deal with the uh, the fire code issue. Uh, we have two tenders or two pumpers, and basically we put one up and it sucks and it sends the water to the one and then it blows. So we, we are able to put out fire, but it is nice to, you know, it, it's it's nice to be able to support future development. It's nice to get up to the recommended level. No, that would just become kind of a little concerned as well. Maybe can we not have some of the uh, if, 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 was that critical? Uh, if, if like, was that critical? Is it, it, is it at a critical level? level? It wasn't at the recommended level. The recommended fire flow for a single family dwelling is 5,000 liters per minute. I think so. I think at the hybrid. At the hybrid. And we had a lot of stuff that was in like the 30 something range. Well, because we have that. Yeah, because we've got the dual pumper, we can get there. And, yeah, because you know, we had that piece of equipment, we could bring it up. But, it was, but we don't want to the boat wasn't there, you couldn't drag it out when the boat wouldn't be there. Well, it doesn't matter how many pumpers you have. You can only, 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 
Yeah, but that's been how many years? Nine years? Yeah. 20 years. 30 for the only fans. I live on Alberta Street. Yeah. Every six weeks, I used to have a water running because when the train rumbled off the tracks, the water line would break. Yeah. I mean, you finally fixed the what? Seven years, eight years ago, yeah. we finally got a new water line in Alberta Street. But before that, every three weeks, I was filling up water. You know, and, 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 six and, and, I, I, what happened when I came here? So I, I wasn't here. I, 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 I'm not I'm like, oh, I hope, I hope we're not. We did have a We did have a long time. We did have a mass water study. We did the map of all the water in the entire town. The water study is the local people to be sure. Hey, the water flow over here. We're blowing up railroad street anyway. We can fix this problem, for sure. facilitate the road by putting in a big name. Like, it, it, it's not a condemnation of anybody. It, it's the map of the condition of how you do it. Uh, one, one thing that uh, Mayor Kennedy said before is uh, when we when you guys were putting in um, services, um, were, were there some lots on the east side that were service? Correct. Correct. And, and yeah, some on the west side as well. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. on the west side? Yeah. 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 My old building. So, um, now we have any water in it since 1933. We, we're putting in, we drop in water and sewer, and we drop in water and sewer for all of them because uh, it's a whole lot cheaper to do it now than it is after the fact. I don't want to rip up the road when somebody new comes to town. And we will charge the new developer a connection fee to, you know, to new Oh, for there. sure, because when a developer goes in yeah. and has, you know, They'll be happy to get they, the they, they have to put the service in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's in there. And we don't want to be digging up the road to put in the service, but we just have to roll over. Yeah. It makes no sense. So. Oh, I can get that. So, yeah. so yeah. then that cost was yeah. passed yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah. that cost 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Anyways, I haven't had a water problem on Alberta Street since the name was fixed. Uh, uh, come on. <laughs> There's been some concerns about snow removal. Maybe you can folks can explain the equipment you have to actually take care of the snow removal on Melway Street. There's been several people who have expressed concerns over how to go on okay. and how to get around the town. And I believe you know, folks have some equipment that is uh, that, that can actually pick up the snow and remove it from the town. Yeah. 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 We also invested two years ago in a um, in a very very high capacity snow lower. We we roughly tripled our snow removal capacity when we pop the snow lower because instead of manually loading the trucks with a with a with a, a loader, we basically just have the truck behind the behind the three road with the snow lower and just pull it through the garage. It was the bike was. People have been using it in Montreal for 100 years. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is I'm surprised we haven't had it. Is I'll get right back to you, John. It is interesting, though, because, like in the city of Calgary, uh, you know, where they do snow clearing, not snow removal. And I mean, they'll go down the same street five times, and all it does is make everybody, you know, park further and further in. And I mean, I. I don't have access to their finances, but you think that it has to be more cost effective to do what we're doing. Go in there once, that whole snowstorm is gone, and then you don't ever have to. You they're, know, they're waiting on the show. That's all they know. I know. You say once. Yeah. Sorry, John, I cut you off. Uh, Where the big change with our snow removal team is our new snow blower has a carbide heat on it. So we ran into a situation, I think it was about two years ago. Where we got this huge snowfall, I think at the very beginning of January, and then we had this freak shit up where it went to like plus 16 and everything half melted, and then we went into deep freeze again. And we literally did not have the capacity to deal with all that far back. Like we, we just couldn't do anything with it. We were waiting for the shit up. Can I finish my question? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we can. You can hear you. In the past, we used the graders and stuff like that. And a lot of the curves look like they really look like shit. Excuse my language. They were all chewed up by the blade and all that stuff. So that's not going to happen again with the equipment that we have now. We're planning to, 
the major Cooper plantations is the smaller equipment for you. Now, for the main roads, like you stay in the lake or the curb, we took them to the, the fall of the school when they're still good. Because we can now move it very, very quickly. Because we have some limitations on how fast we can fill out, that restricted what we can do. Now, because we can move it so quickly, we just jab it in the middle, all without wear, and you know, we've got to a much, much shorter turnaround time than we did. I think part of the thing will be too that uh, part of the issue with banging into the curbs is perhaps uh, knowing the equipment and, and training and that kind of thing, John. So I think that might resolve part of the issue too. Yeah, I have a video of the operation of the degraders in front of my place, banging out of the curbs and yeah. I mean, lifting the front end of the tires off the grader, right. to push the snow over the, the water spills there, and pushing the concrete up off that spot. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's all for the shoot, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, this one down, that's where we're going to put the snow on the sidewalks. So, so that's, that's my that. next question. So, okay. the, the new sidewalk and the big pop house and so on, both has a lot of snow in between. You know, I have to shovel there. The idea of somebody where the business owner is shoveling all the snow all over the shed became a viable last year. So sure, that's a, that's such a good idea because you have these huge pop outs that are you know, sizable. Yeah. Whose responsibility is it? It's like four parking spots. Sorry, four parking spots on both corners. We well, can't park that close to the corners. I know, but the new yeah. big bumbo yeah. things. It's um, like shoveling for four cars. Or so. But you know, and, and that certainly changed over time too. One time we did railway. Now it's the business owners. Uh, I think it's going to be probably a combination of both. And I think it will be like many other things that we're going to try it one way, and if it doesn't work, it'll be a conversation that we're going to continue to have. I, I just think the overall, and, and I mean, I've lived here, I mean, I moved here the first time as a teenager. I've lived here a long time. And can we not have something downtown that is appealing to look at? Because a lot of the people that, um, you know, live here, that are committed to community, Sorry? The bump outs. Are they stripping for your aesthetic pleasure? No, they're, well, they're a, good, yeah, but a good an increased portion. cost. It's going to be an increased inconvenience to everybody. A good portion of it is for the aesthetics, yes. Part of it is for the aesthetics. I want a drag strip because that's what we had. John said it looked better, so I'm going to go with what his opinion is because he's been a world traveler. So. But I voted, I voted against it, but there were some ladies that used to be here, but it would be aesthetically pleasing. I was an old guy, shut up and put up with it. Actually, we've had cross the teenagers killed on our street because of the drivers. Yeah, yeah. And, and now you had a vehicle written off because somebody backed out and yeah. they had a bed for letter and you were doing it. So we had that teenagers killed in cross the Yep. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, they do it on the mountain as well. So yeah. Yeah. There are kids that live in the cross right? Yeah. They're trying to slow traffic down. I guess that's going to work. I'll see. Well, does it work for the rest of these places? Like in the steel, everybody's got them. Uh, Strathmore's got them. Uh, everybody's got them. Yeah. Somebody must be happy with them. It's the new world is moving too fast. This corner, this corner with the bottles. That's got to go great. That, that, that one, that one, that one is going to get yeah. changed. Yeah. Yeah. But for, for the rest of them, and, and I know we went to High River and they had like basically the whole area is a walking area, which uh, apparently feedback is that that was not the outcome that they hoped. But for the rest of the communities that we talked to, they do like the ball pumps. It wasn't like we weren't the first ones to do it. And you know, you can get some information back on it. Um, I mean, again, it was, we went to uh, Gidsbury, Carstairs, Innisfail, Bowden, um, Strathmore, High River, you know, trying to get the best of what we saw at, at, at these places, get the feedback from the public, get the feedback from the businesses. I mean, this wasn't just something dripped up at two o'clock in the morning. Like this is this is feedback from wishes and desires and improving the look of the downtown. So a big, big part of the problem is that nothing is finished yet. I know. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. When we were part of the Calgary Regional Planning 
Uh, we used to have lots of meetings in the community hall with uh, citizen groups to find out what citizens wanted for the future of Crossfield. And a lot of this stuff that's happening now in downtown Crossfield here was brought up and discussed in these round table meetings. And we had a lot of people at those. But since that time, uh, we've dropped out of Calgary. It doesn't, it doesn't exist in no, it not as it's all. I mean, but when we were in that group, we, it cost us so much money a year, but at least we were having discuss, discussions on what the citizens wanted for the future of Crossfield. And now that we've dropped out of that, we're left out here and all the surrounding community around here are all still part of the Calgary Municipal Club. Well, and that's why you have to open houses here and house friendly input and, and do it as we do now. That, that initiative that disappeared a long time ago. So, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, anyway, 8.15, it's been a good discussion. I guess for those that are interested, we'll reconvene next Tuesday. Thank you very much, everybody. You're following up on the meetings for you. Sorry? Yeah, I was rushing. Oh, I got something. Right, okay, next week, we'll be